Now, kind of interesting for us to take a look at what the views are of the major Greek thinkers, and that's Socrates, uh, Plato, and Aristotle, just to get an idea. And back in ancient Greece, they were worried about virtues. Um, that is, what's the virtuous life? You see people who are sort of model citizens, or the gods were models of what you ought to do because they had certain virtues. So back in those times, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were worried about what are these virtues? You know, what are these things that are of value in themselves? And Socrates had an interesting view. You know, if I asked you today, what do you guys value? Maybe you'd say, you know, having a lot of money or having enough money to do that. I think money would be part of it. Worldly goods would be part of it. Socrates thought that that is a wrong conception. People in Greece in his time shared that same conception, that success, money and success were the virtues, and that's what you want to pursue. But he didn't think so. The ultimate virtue for Socrates was knowledge. In fact, he got himself into trouble because he would pursue knowledge to the end, because this was his only virtue. You might call it, as I did there, pursuing self-development, looking for knowledge. Socrates used to walk around in ancient, in, in ancient Athens, and he'd find, you know, the rich and famous, the successful people. You know, think of it today. If you're going to find the successful people, where you go? You might go to Hollywood. You might go to Washington. You might go to Wall Street. And he was pursuing knowledge. And Socrates thought, in fact, we heard from the uh, clip that I had from the Bill and Ted movie, the uh, Bill and Ted, uh, what was it, uh, whatever kind of experience it was that they had, um, their exemplary experience. That's all right. I can't remember the name. But we saw, he said, they've read, yes, yeah, Socrates thought that he knew that he knew that he didn't know anything, so that's why he was running around asking all these people who apparently believed that they didn't know stuff, and Socrates got himself into a lot, of, if you guys know the story, he got himself into a lot of trouble because he made a lot of enemies because he'd ask people who were experts in various subjects, you know, what they knew about the subject, and he pre would proceed to show them that they really knew nothing about the subject. Uh, as a result of that, the, in Athens, they came up with some trumped-up charges, the charges being that he corrupted the youth. I mean, where that came from was he had kind of a following of young people that used to hang around with him. And, and you know, think of it today, the, the, uh, the very wealthy in our society, where would you find them? It'd say, somebody would say, driving their Ferraris, their Maseratis around, flying, you know, between Los Angeles, New York, you know, maybe some European capitals, spending time. What did the rich and famous, the young rich and famous, the spoiled kids had to do, or a group of them? They would hang out with Socrates and watch him ask these very annoying questions. And they were annoying, not because he asked them, but he continued to pursue them, and he continued to go about trying to point out that the people who claim to know all these things really had no knowledge. It ended up that there's a book called The Apology that Plato wrote, which is the trial of Socrates. He gets put on trial for, as I mentioned, corrupting the youth, which, you know, he had these younger fellas, you know, in their teens, their twenties, hanging out with him, watching him make idiots of the political, you know, the, the political leaders, the business leaders, you know, all the people who were the heads of, uh, the, the heads of state, so to speak, of Athens, the leading citizens. Uh, and then they came up with the other one, the other charge, and the other charge was that he, it was blasphemy, that he denied the gods. That was the more critical charge because typically blasphemy in those days carried a penalty of death with it, which he had a trial, got convicted, long story, and I'll make it short, and he was uh, sentenced to death which, by the way, a little bit different than we do it today. Death in ancient Greece meant that you had to drink a poison, the hemlock. But that was the virtue, according to him. So it wasn't material well-being, it was knowledge. And he thought you should spend your life pursuing the good, pursuing wisdom, which is kind of where the word philosophy 
comes from or originates from. Now, Plato was Socrates' student, so certainly he learned a bunch uh, from Socrates, and he too was trying to figure out what the virtues were, and he certainly saw knowledge as being one of the virtues, but Plato comes up with a slightly different view. That is, he starts, wisdom, knowledge was critical. It is certainly is a virtue, but not the only virtue. Courage, if you think about it in those days, they just, one of the historical events was they just finished the major war or they just lost the major war to Sparta, another major Greek colony. Um, so they, having a strong army was important and what is the key, the virtue of a soldier? Courage, to be brave. And the third one, if I, could, if, if I could get it here, it was moderation. That is, oops, you don't do something to an extreme. Do it just to moderation. And let me pop that up again because you, you saw the fourth one coming up and now eventually it's going to come up. Statue, that's supposed to be a statue of Plato. I got it from the internet, I think it was. Might have been Wikipedia. So we had that number three, moderation. And then fourth was justice. And let me, that's kind of an interesting one because we're not talking about the just state. We're talking about justice within a person. And Plato had an interesting theory, talked about the parts of the soul or the parts of a person really in, in modern talk, in modern parlance. Um, and the idea is that the soul, the mind is made up of three parts, the rational part, where you have wisdom is the virtue, then you have the part that's looking for fame and fortune and courage and uh, lets you do things. So that's the part of the soul that you know has the virtue of courage, or it lacks it. And finally, we have part of the soul that controls our, you know, everyday kind of appetites, hunger or food, you know, satisfied by food, a uh, warm place to live, sex, other pleasures, things like that. And the virtue in that area is moderation. Now, those are virtues for the individual three parts of the soul. But the fourth one is justice. And justice comes from the parts of the soul being balanced off in the right way. And how are they balanced off in the right way? Well, knowledge or wisdom, the part of the rational part of the soul, commands the other parts of the soul. And that's what makes for a virtuous person. And interestingly enough, from a political philosophy perspective, Plato has society made up of three kinds of parts analogous to these three kinds of parts. And justice is the same thing. That is, the state becomes like a big man, but or a, a large man, a conglomeration of man having the same sorts of virtues. So that's where, where Plato was on it. Now you can say, gee, you know, so far, okay, we got to gain knowledge. We got in wisdom, courage, moderation, but what makes that, you know, murder, for example, right or wrong? What virtue is it going against? You know, and it's not clear the connection between the virtuous life and evaluating actions. And you're going to see back in ancient Greece, they, there wasn't that clear connection, although I think maybe Aristotle did a slightly better job. Moving to Aristotle and seeing what he has to say about ethics, he divides virtues. He notices there are virtues of the mind. Following Plato and Socrates, he believes that you know, knowledge, pursuit of knowledge, is very important, and there are intellectual virtues. But not only there are intellectual virtues, but there are virtues of character. Character being, you know, we have certain what you might call dispositions, tendencies to behave in certain ways. And the virtues of character are what he calls moral virtues, you know, or what we've called moral virtues. Temperance, you know, you don't go to either extreme. Courage, truthfulness, friendship, justice, 
had a whole list of the moral virtues. These are virtues you can have even if you can't, you know, you're not the greatest student, you're not the brightest mind, you still have, there are virtues of character. And there was something interesting about virtues of character, and that is that the virtues with regard to character are the midpoint, so to speak, the middle between two extreme kinds of behavior. And that's, that's where Aristotle, that's how, the way Aristotle explains this is through what's called his doctrine of the mean. And let me use an example from courage, you know, bravery in war. But the idea is that the virtues are to be found as the mean, kind of the average, the median, what's in, bet in between the two extremes. An example, we have cowardice, you know, guy who's a punk. He tends to run away from even the possibility of any conflict. Agrees with everybody, doesn't want to get anybody mad at him. That's on one end, one extreme. He's just afraid, can't stand up for himself. On the other hand, you might know some people who are a little bit reckless, foolhardy. You know, they're going to start fights no matter what happens, even if there's another better way to accomplish what they need to. You know, this is the little guy walking down the street, sees, you know, the, the four tough guys. You know, he's with you, and he has this great idea as he's passing by to punch the biggest guy in the face. Not too smart. Pretty foolhardy behavior. And what Aristotle sees or points out about th this kind of example is to be courageous is a virtue. It doesn't mean doing anything really stupid, like putting your life at risk by teeing off the wrong people. But it also doesn't mean running away. That is, at the first sign of or because of your fear, that is, you need to control your fear. So controlling your fear puts you in the mean between being a coward and being completely and utterly stupid.